In the wise words of Jane Austen, who once found herself stranded in an airport with nothing to do, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a reader in possession of a lot of free time and an expendable income must be in want of a new book to read. So she hits up the airport bookstore and makes a snap judgment about what book to buy before she boards. But between the endless parade of spy thrillers, romantic escapades, and navel-gazing political tell-alls, how is she supposed to pick quickly? Well. That's what the book cover is for. To let the reader know that here be brooding anti-heroes, or here be heart-pounding action, or here be the next topic of fighting at your family dinner. So despite the adage of not judging a book by its cover, there is clearly a lot of intent, time, and money involved in the science of persuading you to do just that. So how did we even get here? Well, back before the salad days of things like cheap, durable paper, printing presses, and mass literacy, books, nay, the pages themselves, were a luxury commodity, with the covers working double duty as both a protective device and a prestige indicator. Think of those delicate vellum pages ensconced in bejeweled leather and bone covers as a 12th century Irish monk's Louis Vuitton bag. But even following the invention of the printing press, books still didn't have much in the way of covers at the point of sale, and often it was on the onus of the reader to have his or her book bound in some sort of leather cover, and probably in the same color to really bring that private library together. But by the late 1820s, cloth covers were hot. God, get with it, Karen! At first, simple paper labels were glued on the front, and then they could be stamped with patterns and titles and borders, but not much else. Dust jackets were a thing, in that they were basically paper bags used to protect books in stores and transport them home and then thrown away. But with the rise of the arts and crafts movement in the 1880s, and its focus on aesthetics in material culture like wallpaper, furniture, and yes, books, an interest in the zhuzhing up of the common tome was in the air. And before the internet was even around to be blown up, an illustrated periodical by the name of The Yellow Book blew up the not internet because it wasn't invented yet when Oscar Wilde was arrested in 1895, reportedly folding a copy of its first edition. While perhaps this wasn't the best for The Yellow Book sales, it was a turning point in highlighting the cover and its artwork by illustrator Aubrey Beardsley, which was something new and different to the Victorians. By the 1920s, dust jackets were back in vogue and now have the swanky new edition of flaps. These paper covers could be printed with much more interesting designs at a lower cost, and thus a new era of creativity is ushered in. One such publisher that took notable advantage of this was Penguin. Founded in 1935, Penguin basically changed the game when they leaned into a business model that focused on affordable paperbacks of good books with an artistic cover design that could replace the elegant desirability of hardcover editions. As a result, they quickly become one of the era's most successful publishers, thanks in part to a highly stylized and instantly recognizable cover branding, which separates them in a wildly competitive market that relies on an inconsistent and graphic-heavy cover. As time has passed, the book cover story has been a tangle of trends, some responding to wider concepts in art and graphic design, and this is before you even dive into what's happening on a genre level. See the 1940s boom in the pulp style cover of women running away or looking terrified of everything. Even Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights got this treatment. Or the 80s and 90s celebrity author trend in which author names literally became the driving imagery on covers. Stephen King, for example, had a font that was so ubiquitous, it is now the inspiration for an equally ubiquitous popular TV show title treatment. And let's not forget the so-called chiclet genre with its own ubiquitous brand of stylized twee a la Eat, Pray, Love, The Devil Wears Prada, and The Nanny Diaries. And yet again, we are brought to Stephanie Meyer's Twilight series. Say what you will about the books themselves, but the deceptively simple but striking cover design, created by graphic designer Gail Dubonin, influenced not only the way YA novels were presented, but outside genres as well. Says indie author and publisher Lucy Blue, I still say Twilight is one of the best book covers ever. It has absolutely nothing to do with the story, but it speaks to all of the things the book wanted to plant in the mind of potential readers. The Snow White and Fairy Tale Princess mythology, the danger, is the apple poison, gothic true love, all that black and red and temptation. And I remained convinced that the series would not have sold so well with any other cover art. 
Like any art form, however, book covers themselves raise a host of questions that run deeper than what will make this seem sexy? Should a cover be indicative of what the story is about? To what degree? Or should its appeal lie simply in what will impact the potential reader the most quickly? Some examples of authorial intent and how it interacts with what publishers were interested in pushing comes from two infamous books from the 20th century. Francis Kuhat's now iconic cover for The Great Gatsby was designed before F. Scott Fitzgerald had even completed his manuscript, and there is much debate over how much the cover and text influenced each other, with Kuhat supposedly inspired by conversation with Gatsby publisher Max Perkins, and Fitzgerald all out proclaiming that the art was practically embedded into the text. For Christ's sake, don't give anyone that jacket you're saving for me, Fitzgerald wrote to his publisher while he, like any good author, sat on delivering a late manuscript. I've written it into the book. While we're not sure exactly what Fitzgerald was referring to specifically in this letter, it's theorized that the haunting eyes from Kuhat's design manifested themselves as the Dr. T.J. Eckelberg billboard that shows up repeatedly in the novel and on your AP American Literature exam. On the opposite end of the spectrum, Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita originally had to be published with a simple green cover. Nabokov deferred to something simple in design in the face of finding something appropriate, but was emphatic on one huge creative decision. Said Nabokov, there is one subject which I am emphatically opposed to, any kind of representation of a little girl. Meanwhile, more than 60 years later, we've been inundated with reprintings of Lolita featuring, well, Sorry, Nabokov. One can only speculate on how long-dead authors of now public domain texts might feel about the endless, fast money republishing of their works. And lest you think this only applies to books of yesteryear, representation versus text is an ongoing issue, especially because of the persistent notion that most authors have major input into what goes into their book covers. They don't. From Ursula K. Le Guin's Earthsea series, to Octavia E. Butler's Dawn, to the recent and high-profile case in which the U.S. edition of Justine Larbalestier's Liar featured a white face on the cover of a book with a black protagonist, whitewashing in book covers remains an ongoing controversy. In the end, book covers, like books themselves, are the end result of a lot of deep thought, artistry, technical business maneuverings, and hard work, not to mention a response to the world in which they are made. Book covers and illustrations play a huge part in shaping our collective imagination, whether in the weeping eyes over the New York City skyline, or the fluid whorls of a carousel horse, or the bewitchingly bright universe of a wizarding school. So the next time your flight's been grounded indefinitely because of weather or greedy airlines overbooking their flights, don't judge a book by its cover, but maybe give the cover a second deeper look.